soft despotism arises when, through through this combination of of ideas about uh, you know democratic ideas, sentiments, mores, plus centralization and industrial science, that that together create what is for Tocqueville a mistaken idea about what politics is and what what human flourishing is, what well-being is. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In this episode, we dive into some of the profound changes occurring in American society. Back in the day, social scientist Robert Putnam observed a concerning trend. He called it bowling alone, where Americans were becoming increasingly disconnected from community bonds and support systems. Fast forward to the present, and we see not only a retreat from these vital sources of communal life, but also a rise in loneliness, anxiety, depression, and overall mental and physical distress. Marriage and parenthood are also being delayed or foregone altogether. These developments have far-reaching implications for both American politics and civil life, as well as for the individual's well-being and fulfillment. Taking us back to the roots of democratic thought, We turn to Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Tocqueville recognized the unique nature of the democratic social state and the need for a, quote, new political science to navigate its strengths and weaknesses. He explored how the principles of democratic equality would transform our intellect, sentiments, and social norms, painting vivid images of democracy and the dangers of soft despotism that still resonate today. While Tocqueville's masterpiece provides a comprehensive view of American democracy, there are areas he did not directly address. One such topic is friendship, a central element in Tocqueville's own life. Although seemingly absent from his work, we can draw upon Tocqueville's theories, as well as insights from Aristotle and C.S. Lewis to ask, how does democratic equality transform friendship, a fundamental association crucial to human flourishing? Today, Dan Churchwell, Director of Programs and Education here at the Acton Institute, talks with Sarah Gustafson as they explore how democratic equality opens up new possibilities for meaningful connections, while also introducing habits and trends that can erode genuine companionship and push individuals into the, quote, solitude of their own hearts. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Sarah Gustafson is a Ph.D. candidate in political theory at Harvard University, where she's completing her dissertation on the thought of Alexis de Tocqueville. She graduated from Davidson College and earned an M.A. in the history of political thought at Queen Mary University of London, where she won the Quentin Skinner Prize for Excellence in the History of Political Thought. During her years at Harvard, she has had the opportunity to work closely with many professors, including Harvey Mansfield and Michael Sandel. She is also a fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, your topic was uh, really intriguing to me uh, when I heard you, you know, at the conference here several months ago, and really appreciate you joining us uh, for our Acton lecture series earlier today. And 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 like I mentioned, you know, um, this topic is is on the forefront of everybody's mind. I I couldn't have planned it better. This morning, the U.S. Surgeon General releases a public health threat announcement. Just this morning, you know, the Washington Post, a bunch of people picked it up on this epidemic of loneliness. Um, and, you know, he, he argues that, you know, government funds should go towards research, should go towards zoning, should go towards mandates in, um, you know, insurance, et cetera. You know, he just lists this whole litany of how to help fix this epidemic of loneliness. And so tell me a little bit about um, this idea of how did friendship and Alexis de Tocqueville kind of emerge. You know, where where did you you know really start getting interested in the combination of Alexis and and this idea of of friendship? Well, um, 
as I as I mentioned a little bit in the introduction in, in the introduction to my talk today, uh, Tocqueville is is a uh, liberal, but he's a strange liberal. Um, he has as many echoes, possibly more echoes, with the classical tradition, Plato, Aristotle, even Augustine. Uh, than he does with his fellow his fellow liberals. He's not a contract theorist. He's not uh, proposing a state of nature. He very much believes that man is by nature social, political, religious, interested. But I would argue that his interest is fulfilled through the fulfillment of his nature, right? Through his social, political, religious nature. And so, um, though there's been surprisingly little from again an academic point of view written on Tocqueville and this question of friendship, Um, because I'm interested in the ancient political philosophy tradition, Plato, Aristotle, and because I I just love thinking with Tocqueville, um, thinking creatively, philosophically, as well as studying what he actually did say, um, it, uh, it, it sort of came to me that why has there not been something written on, or more rather, written on Tocqueville on this topic of friendship. Is he making a statement about democracy by not addressing friendship head on in democracy in America in the way that he addresses the family, marriage, uh, the education of women, the relationships between bosses and employees, and how that differs from the relationship between uh, aristocratic relationship between servants and masters? Um, so that was that was one genesis of the of the project. Um, but also, I think you know, I, I'm I, I like to be an observer of of politics, of of human nature in particular days and ages. I've been a PhD student and PhD candidate at Harvard uh, for about six years now. I'm finishing up this year, and and so it's been very interesting to me as a as a millennial to watch younger generations uh, approach approach friendship, approach technology, think about. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, okay, you're gonna have to cut some of that stuff out, but um, it's just, I, I think younger generations are increasingly uh, devoted to certain forms of technology, right? That's not, that's not a remarkable statement. Sure. Um, but there are also members of the younger generation who are, who are wondering how things could be otherwise, because they see the possibly pernicious effects of a TikTok, all these sorts of things. And so, um, again, as someone who likes to observe human nature, who likes to observe politics, and, and who cares very deeply about about the welfare of, of my students' welfare broadly understood, um, I found myself drawn to tackling tackling this this subject of does Tocqueville offer us any resources to think about the shape and contours and um, and and strengths of human relationships under democracy. And whatever their weaknesses might also be. Now, for our listeners, I mean, many might be, um, you know, familiar with the basis idea, uh, basic idea of Alexis de Tocqueville. But, you know, he, he's writing uh, about 200 years ago um, or visiting at least America 200 years ago and then writing on it a little later. Can you give just a brief intro of like what, what was his project? What was he yes. doing? Yes. So Tocqueville was born uh, in uh, the early 1800s in France. He's the son of... Of an aristocratic family, uh, his great his his grandfather on his mother's side, um, or maybe great grandfather. You might have to excuse me on that. Um, but his 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 ancestor on his mother's side was uh, an Enlightenment era French reformer named Malzerbe, who actually came out of retirement to defend Louis the Sixteenth as he was being tried before the revol- you know before the revolutionary tribunals. Um, so he had this ser- this this history of service to France that was compatible with reform, but also very dedicated to trying to serve France as it was. Um, and so, so Tocqueville has this aristocratic lineage, but he's born uh, after the revolution. His parents were nearly uh, were nearly guillotined. Most of his family died in the revolution, um, and this this deeply scarred his parents, deeply scarred his family. And so he grew up in this rather conservative Catholic Norman household as the younger son of an aristocrat. Uh, became a lawyer, um, and while he was studying law uh, in, in Paris and then in Versailles, uh, he became particularly interested in liberal democracy, ideas of liberalism. And uh, after the revolution of 1830, which put a different monarch on on the French throne, I'll simplify French politics in this era because it's incredibly complicated. But anyways, Tocqueville and one of his good friends, Beaumont, at this point, they're in their their mid-late 20s. 
decide that it would be a good idea for them to travel to America nominally to study the penitentiary system. Uh, criminal justice reform, penitential, you know, penitentiary system reform was a, a sort of cause célèbre in France at the time. And so they got the, they, they, they got the permission from the French government to be released from their, their uh, role as lawyers um, to travel to America for what was originally planned to be a year. It ended up being nine months. What was it about the American penitentiary system that they were interested in? Like what well, there are a number of different models of penitentiaries. So there's the Auburn system, the Philadelphia system, Sing Sing. They, they made plans to visit a variety of these different uh, prison systems that were, again, you know, federal, right? So they were located you know, in these different states and they each had their own different models. And so, um, so you know, Tocqueville and Beaumont very much wanted to see, was there a model that they could pick up and bring back to France, adopt it or adapt it in some way for the particularities of the French system? Um, but they wanted to draw inspiration, and as they're as they're they're traveling through America, uh, they they begin to be inspired that maybe there's more here uh, that we can write on than just the penitentiary system. Uh, Beaumont goes on to write, and and Gustave de Beaumont and, and Tocqueville were were lifelong, essentially lifelong friends. Um, Beaumont was one of the last people to visit Tocqueville before he died. Um, there's there's a, a, a Tocqueville scholar, uh, Seymour Drescher, who says that it, it, you, you can understand them at many points as having a kind of intellectual division of labor. Um, so by the end of their time traveling through America, they uh, they write their report on the penitenti- penitentiary system. It wins them accolades. And uh, Beaumont begins to write a text called Marie or On Slavery in the United States, which was a a rather strange text because it was both a novel and um, a kind of commentary on on the relationships between um, indigenous Americans, uh, black Americans, both freed and enslaved, and white Americans. And Tocqueville begins the project of writing on writing democracy in America. And eventually he produces two volumes. Volume one's published 1835, volume two published 1840. Um, volume one made him uh, made him a, a celebrity overnight. Volume two was was uh, relatively less popular, mm. though I think John Stuart Mill hit it on the head when he said that it's um, it's harder to uh, volume two is much more philosophical than volume one. Volume one is philosophical, but it's also sociological. It's a it's, it's you know the descriptions of the township. These are the, the the parts of democracy in America we often assign in political science courses in the United States. And so, so these two these two books um, uh, make Tocqueville's career, and he goes on to have a have a career uh, as a politician and a policy wonk um, before eventually serving uh, serving in the government as foreign minister after the eighteen forty eight French Revolution, um, and eventually retires uh, because he's not he doesn't support Napoleon the Third um, and dies. Uh, a few years after he wrote his last his last text, uh, the Ancien Regime of the Revolution. Hmm. So, so were those two books or the, or the two parts of Democracy in America? Were those all based on his nine month the notes from his nine months, or did he return to America? They were they were based on the notes from those nine months and additional research that he conducted from France. Um, so he hired a number of, of English speaking research assistants when he returned to France, and um, you know dove deep into. Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, the Federalist Papers, um, a variety of different kinds of uh, jurisprudential, legal, political texts on the United States, but also but also philosophical texts, um, and that certainly comes across uh, more in Volume Two, the 1840, the second half, uh, than than Volume One. So he continued his research, continued to mull over what he had seen, and to try to draw from the particular facts that he saw on the ground to form a, a general theory. Um, of 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 democracy in America, but also democracy in the, as a social state more broadly. Well, the the way it persists to this very day is uh, is emblematic of, of how impactful it has been o- o- over the last two hundred years. And before we get into some of his ideas about individualism and you know soft despotism, let let's rewind about 2,000 years or so. Um, I used to be a, a professor and I taught for about 10 years. And one thing about by my second year, I, I taught introduction to philosophy. And so sophomores, all, you know, generally all sophomores. And when we were going through the Nicomachean ethics, I always, I was fascinated, you know, and you do the professor's privilege of, you know, bringing out what interests you at times. And it was his three kinds of friendship that, and, and, and within, you know, two years, it, I, it, 
students I could tell just were eating that up or had never heard it, you know, thought through that way, et cetera. And so can you talk about um, that section of, you know, three kinds of friendship, friendships of pleasure, utility, and virtue, or, you know, it, it's said different ways. But um, how important was that? What, how was Aristotle or, or why was Aristotle interested in friendship? Right. So, so the Nicomachean ethics is, uh, there, I mean, there's a way in which you, you, it's helpful to understand the relationship between Aristotle's um, ethics and politics, right? That, that the ethics lead to the politics, right? Which means that you can't do politics without ethics, right? You can't do politics without a vision of the good life. Yeah. And so in the Nicomachean ethics, which again is a, a kind of part one to the politics, um, Aristotle lays out you know, what he takes to be the virtues necessary for a flourishing human life. And some of these map better onto modern virtues or Christian virtues than others. Um, something like uh, magnanimity and liberality, right? Uh, Aristotle has a view that in order to be fully virtuous, you have to have a certain amount of money, right? Either enough to give uh, moderately or enough to give extremely generously, right? Right. Um, but he develops this account of the virtues. He also includes, um, uh, you know, temperance, um, wit, urbanity. Um, there's a variety. There's there's uh, you know some eleven, um, and then he he pauses as he reaches the end of the Nicomachean Ethics to to lay out his account of of, of friendship, which in its highest form is virtue seeking. So he says that um, the virtue seeking friendship are are. Two people who are, are, you know, maybe a little bit more, but, you know, in the form of two friends, two friends who are alike in virtue that are pursuing a good together, pursuing the good of virtue together. Um, and this is different from the pleasure-seeking friendship where it's uh, uh, two friends who are pursuing the good of golfing together. Right. They're not pursuing the good life in its highest form, which is the virtue seeking friendship. Um, they're not necessarily helping one another to become virtuous. They're helping one another on their golf game. Right. And they're experiencing a kind of companionship as they do. So it's not a bad form of friendship. It's actually essential. It's just not the highest form. Um, and then this is, you know, the, the, the pleasure seeking friendship can be differentiated from and this this has a number of different forms. But the the instrumental friendship, the friendship that. Um, you know, you're not seeking pleasure, but you're, you know, um, your friends at work, right? Um, your friendship is, is conditioned by the fact that you work together and it's a genuine friendship. But, but again, it's not the highest form. And so, um, so, so Aristotle develops this account uh, in order to, to say that and to reflect the fact that he takes us to be social beings, that, that man is uh, by nature a social and political animal. That we are rational animals and that we uh, find a certain fulfillment in our nature, not only in companionship, but in companionship that seeks after virtue. Um, and so, so that is you know, really foundational to his view of politics because politics is oriented towards human flourishing, a view of the good life and pursuing that good life together. Um, and there's a kind of analog to the virtue-seeking friendship in politics, which is the political friendship. So the friendship among citizens that allow us to uh, rule and be ruled in turn, which again requires a kind of similarity of, of virtue. Yeah, absolutely. And when de Tocqueville is thinking about his – I mean you, you fast forward you know, to millennia and all of – you know, it, it, there's a lot – to understand, you know, to make an understatement of the century, there's a lot that goes on in between <laughs> when Aristotle is developing that idea and what de Tocqueville sees in America in 1830 or, or 31. So, um, you know, you fast forward and here de Tocqueville is seeing democracy um, in all of its – and I appreciate your approach because there is some r obvious great things within democracy, but obviously some warts as well or, or things that it develops other kinds of characteristics um, that – are usually construed as negative. And so one of those that you see both positive and negatively talked about is individualism, like with this greater autonomy or this, this idea of individualism. So how did he see and interpret, let, let alone what, it, what we think about it right now, how was he viewing, uh, de Tocqueville viewing this idea of autonomy and individualism in America at that time? Yes, so so he develops an account of of individualism as a specifically democratic vice. So um, one could say 
that human beings are by nature selfish or self-interested, right? That is uh, in, in its strongest form. You see that in Hobbes. You see it in somewhat a weaker form in, in Locke. Um, Tocqueville says that we are by nature self-interested. He says somewhere um, in the first volume of Democracy in America that uh, interest is one of the fixed points, maybe the only fixed point in the human heart. Uh, so humans, by nature, seek the fulfillment of our interest, i.e. we seek to be happy. <laughs> we seek what makes us happy or what we think will make us happy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we are also, again, by nature political, by nature religious. Um, and so we are not simply or merely self-interested. Um, and so these elements of our nature kind of work with one another in very interesting ways. And so, so individualism, he wants to say, is, is not natural in the same way that a kind of base selfishness, one could say, is natural. The base selfishness that would be the pursuit of your self-interest at the expense of these other elements of your nature that are social or political, um, that would tie you, therefore, to people, right? Mm -hmm. Both religion and politics tie you to people right. in an important and essential way. Um, so he, he makes this differentiation between uh, between e an egotism, which is as old as the world, based selfishness with democratic individualism, which is which flows from a misunderstanding about what is in our interests and what is good for us, what our well-being is, and that therefore leads us to love the wrong things leads us to close in on ourselves, to, to restrict the scope of our duties um, to only those who, who have immediate interest to us, our immediate uh, surroundings, our immediate family, our immediate friends, rather than having a more capacious understanding of, of the ways in which we have duties and obligations of, of justice, but also of care, of love to one another. Would, uh, would the modern word empathy fit in, you know, with that idea of love and care and compassion, there seems to be over the last decade, you know, this rise in the use of the term empathy. Mm -hmm. Is that an interplay here at all? Or? Um, yes, possibly. I'm, I'm hesitant to say to yes, say yes wholeheartedly because you always have to ask what does someone mean by by empathy or by sympathy, Fair enough, right? Yeah. So so someone like Adam Smith has quite a, quite a developed idea of what sympathy entails uh, in his theory of moral sentiments, mm -hmm. right? And he very much sees sympathy as as providing um, providing a kind of glue. Um, glue is maybe the wrong word, but a, a, a kind of um, uh, grease in the wheels of a certain kind of uh, improvement of our moral sentiments comparable to um, how self-interest actually works in the market, right? That we can be uh, we can be sympathetic in a sense by pursuing a certain form of self-interest through the market that actually serves other people mm -hmm. by providing other people what they want through the market. Um, so, so I, I'm I'm hesitant to 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 describe this as 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 empathy, but he does certainly use the word compassion. That uh, democratic peoples have a certain kind of very broad capacity to to identify with others on the basis of our shared. You know, our, our feelings of equality, but also our shared feelings of weakness, mm -hmm. right? Um, but but the converse of that, he says, is that uh, very rarely do do Democrats who have this feeling of broad compassion feel that they have particular duties to other people to act on those feelings of compassion. Hence, as I, as I mentioned in the, the talk earlier today, they rarely perform acts of sacrifice. They rarely. You know, uh, Democrats are far less likely to die for one another, mm -hmm. even if they are far more likely to sympathize or to feel compassion for one another. And you're using Democrats, obviously, in the, the broadest, the, the, the historical. The most, most capacious yeah. sense possible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Another point that I thought was interesting and related in your talk was that in Democracy in America, he doesn't explicitly engage friendship qua friend or friendship as friendship, but it, you find it more though uh, explained biographical or in his letters, et cetera. Can you just talk about that a little bit, how he – from his life, you perceive that friendship was important? Yes. So he um, – I, I think there's, a, there's certainly a danger – in in reading any philosopher and and trying to glean too much from his theory about his life, and yet you can always learn something. I think the history is actually fascinating, and it's and it's a mistake to 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 ignore it. So so Tocqueville was known for being rather shy, 
for often being melancholy. He was not as gregarious as his friend uh, Gustave de Beaumont, which, with whom he traveled through America. And yet he was incredibly devoted to his friends um, and, and maintained friendships for decades throughout his life. Um, he's, he's often said to have had a, a, a close friendship with John Stuart Mill. Um, realistically, they exchanged letters for a number of years. I think they, they, they felt that they understood each other on a number of, a number of political, political topics, but John Stuart Mill was not one of his closest friends by any stretch of the imagination. Um, these other friends of his were instrumental in helping him to formulate his ideas in thinking about subjects he was struggling with, such as, you know, the relationship between the church and the state, Catholicism and liberty. You know, even early on in his career, upon returning from America, he found himself in a position where he had to defend one of his dear friends, Louis de Kergolay, as a cousin, one of his one of his oldest friends, uh, d- defend him in a trial because Kergolay had participated in a plot to overthrow the new monarchy. <laughs> wow. So Tocqueville uh, steps in and acts as, a, you know, hel- helps defend him in this trial despite not sharing Kergolay's political beliefs. Mm. Um, so he really went to bat for his friends, really um, appreciated them, loved them very dearly. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, his letters are just absolutely wonderful to read on this account. Uh, you know, but he was also he was also more than willing to 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 criticize his friends. Um, so, um, you know, one of his research assistants during the 1840s was a fellow by the last name of, of Gobineau, who later became quite well known for propagating uh, really um, terrible theories of scientific racism. Mm-hmm. And so, there are letters from from later on in their in their knowledge of each other uh, in the 1850s, where where Tocqueville condemns his views. Condemns his views, wants to, um, uh, does not want to necessarily abandon the friendship, but condemns his views as inconsistent with political liberty, inconsistent with human freedom, more generally speaking, and inconsistent with Christianity. Um, and so Tocqueville is really a great model of, a great model in his own personal life of of the virtues of of friendship, and and one could say that perhaps. Perhaps that that element of his life made him increasingly aware of the ways in which democratic society could mobilize against friendship specifically and against association more broadly. Explain that a little bit. Yeah. How, how would he think that would be adverse to those ideas? Right. So, so again, he doesn't speak of friendship directly in, in Democracy in America, but we all, you know, many of us who've, who have any familiarity with him are, know his praise for civil associations, free associations. And there are a number of passages where he, he describes the natural diversity of, of man, even within a great political society such as the United States or France, and says that natural diversity means that men will break into groups. They will find points of interest or pleasure, and will, they will organize around that. Golfers will golf, right? Uh, families will form. Um, painters will paint. And that reflects human diversity. That reflects our self-interest. That reflects uh, many of the best parts of our nature, right? And he says that you know it's, it's, to, it's a misunderstanding of what democratic equality ought to be to force all these different groups, the painters, the golfers, this family, that family, to try to lead the same kind of life, to try to have a common existence uh, or too common an existence. He says this is quite tyrannical. Um, and so, so though he doesn't speak of friendship directly, I think we can very much understand him as, as thinking of friendship as, as, as one of the associations, um, one of the ways by which we gather together and pursue pursue ends in this um, in this manner consistent with principles of subsidiarity, mm-hmm. right? No, yeah, absolutely. And there's a vein of thought about you know modern whether liberalism or, or democracy that argues that you know this individualism that emerges. And again, now we're fast forwarding 200 years to now, like there's this, whether you take Charles Taylor or, you know, this idea of disenchantment in the world. And not only is there good that emerges, but significant downsides as well to this in individualism. And what, what, what do you think? Did he, 
was he able to foresee some of the disenchantment possibly coming? I mean, I hate to say the word prophet or, you know, is, is there a prophetic tone to, to de Tocqueville at all? Certainly, certainly. And you would not be the first person to use the word prophet to okay. refer to to refer to Tocqueville. Um, I, I mean, what's uh, what's remarkable and, and I think helps people keep returning to his text year after year is uh, – is on the one hand, I mean, some will complain that he's too vague. And so, you know, at the end of Democracy in America, Volume 1, he seems to predict the Cold War, <laughs> right? That that America will, uh, you know, assuming no change, will, will, will represent equality and democracy in freedom, and that Russia will be equality uh, in servitude, right? So, yeah. so people take that as predicting the Cold War. Um, skeptics say this is uh, a very you know, broad and vague claim that, you know, it's hard to say this is a prediction of the Cold War precisely. Um, But he does have an incredible uh, insight and it's a creative insight. It's 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 a kind of political imagination that um, that I think is is necessary to do political theory and political philosophy well. And that I think um, I think uh, I, I take it as important to to when I'm teaching political theory to sort of awaken students to this possibility, right? Um, that he has this capacity to think creatively um, about the possible unraveling or the possible logic of a sequence of events um, that could lead as as you know democracy in America finishes with soft despotism, right? Which soft despotism uh, which includes not just the individualism that that you've pointed out, right, but is the combination of uh, democratic uh, misunderstandings about what human well-being is, what humans are, um, what we ought to love and to, to, to think and then to love, um, how we ought to behave with one another, as well as these greater um, uh, systemic, one could say, forces of administrative centralization and and industrial uh, industrial science. So, yeah, I mean, you're speaking of prophetic. You're prophetic because that was my next question. This, you you answered a question in the earlier lecture, um, and I'm going to paraphrase what the question was. But you, you I think, used a quote that 50 percent of Americans um, have less or, or three friends. I think you know that. Uh, yeah, three or fewer. Yeah, three or fewer friends, and and somebody in the audience, you know, mentioned, well, is that just kind of, you know, self-reporting? Is that really real? And you said, well, you know, people, you know, this soft despotism, according to de Tocqueville, it, it leads people that it, there, it might be a possibility people don't know what they actually need. Or I, mm-hmm. I mean, explore that because mm-hmm. that's kind of provocative mm-hmm. for you to say, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, do I, I made me think, I'm like, do I really know what I need? I mean, you know, it help unpack that a little Certainly. bit. So, um, and this is where I think, you know, uh, Tocqueville, as brilliant as we all know him to be, uh, is actually undersold in his brilliance. Because if you look at this, so so the, the, the discussion of soft despotism falls at the very end of volume two. So the last thing he wrote, um, published in 1840, uh, the structure of, of the text of volume two, part one begins with the ideas, begins with the intellect, the impact of democracy on the intellectual on the intellectual movement is the way he describes it. And there he outlines um, democratic ideas of the good, democ- the nature of uh, intellectual authority. Um, here he harkens back to some of his writings in the, on the tyranny of the majority um, and develops them further. Uh, he says that uh, Democrats, because uh, everyone is equal – believe that their opinion has the same weight as any anyone else's opinion, but that makes their opinion in, infinitely weaker to the opinion of the crowd, of the majority, right? So, so there's this kind of cognitive dissonance where on the one hand, we, um, we take our opinion as, as, uh, as, as extremely valid, but we also are more than willing to defer to the opinion of the majority, right? Taking them as having sort of the collective stock, Right of, of of wisdom. From there, he he argues that Democrats will be particularly inclined to believe in very general and generally applicable ideas, to come to endorse a kind of pantheism, um, to believe in uh, uh, the broad forces of history shaping history as opposed to individual human liberty. Um, and here I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over a very rich section of the text that is that is worth reading. Um, 
But broadly speaking, he wants to start this second volume with thinking about democratic ideas of of the good, right? Uh, what de- Democrats conceive of as good and as true. Part two, the sentiments. How do these ideas about what is good or what is true change what Democrats love, what they pursue, what their idea of well-being is? And here he outlines that we have Democrats have a, have an insatiable desire for equality at the expense of liberty. That the pursuit of too much well-being, particularly if that well-being is understood principally according to material things, not as a mix of spiritual and material, which is what Tocqueville takes humans to be, both spiritual and material, um, that too much pursuit of well-being actually undermines real well-being and leads us uh, leads us to become more like brutes and less like men. Um, the next section, part three, is on how the ideas and the sentiments, so our what we think and what we love, change how we interact with one another, our mores and manners. And it's only then, after having walked through these three sections, that Tocqueville gives us soft despotism. So once we've arrived at soft despotism, we've reached a place where Tocqueville's deeply concerned that Democrats will have a bad idea of what well-being is, have a bad idea of what their freedoms are. Is that the term, like well-being? Is well-being. that the term he uses? Yeah, okay. yeah it, is the, it is the term he uses, well-being, uh, bien-être, um, uh, though he uses a couple other terms that also get translated as well-being, but it's well-being. So, so soft despotism arises when through through this combination of of ideas about uh, you know democratic ideas, sentiments, mores, plus centralization and industrial science, that that together create what is for Tocqueville a mistaken idea about what politics is and what what human flourishing is, what well-being is. But it creates this kind of uncanny valley in which, um, from from Tocqueville's point of view as he's writing it, he can say, this is not political liberty. Uh, Citizens in this this softly despotic situation under the tutelary power are more like subjects than free citizens. As he says, they're, they're, they're both more than kings because they have the vote, because they um, have this welfare that's been been guaranteed to them. They're more than kings, but they're also less than men because they don't exercise the full capacity. They, they don't exercise their full human capacity. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it creates this, it's, it's, it's fascinating when I teach this to students and I am, um, Because on the one hand, I I, I want them to grasp the full power of the theory. I don't want them to see it merely as a kind of um, – I I don't want them to see it as as too fantastical that they don't grasp on to what what, what he may be saying that that could or could not reflect um, our world today, right, or the potential evolution of our world today. And so – so it's it's a it's a question worth posing. Do people living under soft despotism know that they are unfree? Do they know that they have a bad idea of what uh, of what human flourishing or what their well being is? In what ways might they be awoken uh, awakened to to think about what an alternative vision of well being might be? Mm-hmm. Right. And when you were talking about this specific idea, it reminded me, um, and again, many people will know this too, but uh, C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, the second chapter um, on the head, the chest, and the belly, Mm -hmm. you know, choices out of appetite, choices out of intellect, or just raw brain power. Mm -hmm. And then Lewis argues that there needs to be this mediating or um, this chest where the affections or the sentiments emerge, Mm -hmm. magnanimity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does he, I mean, is this is this map onable? Is is this a similar concept of if, if people are under soft despotism, are they just lacking the chest? Is, mm-hmm. is, is it similar? Mm-hmm. I think I think there are certainly echoes. Um, there are certainly echoes. I mean, I would I would um, uh, I would want to to take another look at at the abolition of man. But I mean, when you hear just just from a surface from a from a um, I mean, to say they are more, you know, men are more than kings, but less than men. Right. And now we make men without chests. We we castrate and, and, and ask them to be fruitful. Yeah. Right. There there are profound echoes in the diagnosis of of a certain kind of attempt to um, 
overcome nature technologically. Because that would have been 100 years later, almost on the nose. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I think one way that you can very productively understand some of what's happening in soft despotism, right, is it's the imposition of a kind of science, right? Um, Administrative science and and a certain kind of industrial technological science, right? uh, one of my um, one of my my other projects that I'm that I'm working on is is on Tocqueville's engagement with um, San Simonian and Comtean political thought, and um, and you know San Simonians and Comteans were extremely pro using using a very you know various kinds of industrial and administrative science to to try to bring order and stability um, uh, for many you know for for many benevolent reasons sure. right. Um, but Tocqueville, I think, is is very is is, is wary of of gaining that of trying to master certain elements of human nature in the name of stability because he would prioritize he, he would pri- he would prefer restlessness in liberty to um, to to uh, a sort of stationary inertia that does not allow man to be fully himself. When he was looking at, because you said you know he was a politician, right? Mm-hmm. And and so there there has to be a little bit of utilitarian or pra- pragmatism mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. he's looking at you know mm-hmm. some of these ideas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you said what was uh, you mentioned he was interested in railroads, and I mean he right. he had Absolutely. to be very practical, Absolutely. in certain senses in his Absolutely. in his job. Um, but where where does the industrialism, I I uh, technology, and you know the future of work, and uh, all the conversation about AI right now, you know, mm-hmm. is, is a fa- mm-hmm. many people. I mean, you can't escape the conversation really about it. Um, how did in his era did he see industrialization? Um, did he see it as a control mechanism or something that is is absolutely needed as um, as the age emerges? Yes. Yeah, so so. Uh, as a matter of as a matter of his his theoretical work, um, he's often he's often criticized for being insufficiently attentive, particularly when he's traveling through the United States to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, he didn't visit Lowell, Massachusetts, for instance, which was which was well known in France at the time. A number of other travelers to America did visit Lowell. He doesn't speak at length about. And why would it be known in France at the time? Uh, because there's a great deal of interest in trying to use industry and use industrial science uh, production to to restore the social fabric. Yeah, so yeah. that's you know the San Simonians, uh, a variety of different kinds of liberals, but also utopian socialists who are hmm. very invested in this. Uh, Fourier, Owen, um, there are a variety of different kinds um, of, of utopian socialists who 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 believe that industry is is, is part of the answer. Um, so, so Tocqueville doesn't he doesn't pay attention to that. He he you know follows the situation of the Bank of the United States um, because of his his interest and his dislike of Jackson. Um, but but he's often criticized for being insufficiently attentive to matters of political economy. Hmm. Um, but that having been said, he does have a very famous chapter where he considers uh, that a new posits that a new aristocracy will arise from the development of industry. And um, actually cites Adam Smith. He makes reference to the pin factory from from um, from Smith's work, famously. Um, and 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 Tocqueville ponders what will this new if aristocracy look like? We know what the old feudal aristocracy looked like. Well, what is, the, the the benefit of the old feudal aristocracy was that lords had very clearly defined duties and responsibilities towards their serfs. Um, they that, that that were that were you know. Historic, ancient, traditional, clearly defined. The new aristocracy that might arise from industry does not have that kind of relationship with its working class. This is this is the liberal, this is the progressive right. Tocqueville coming out here, right? And so, uh, Tocqueville's critical of a potential future where, um, where by virtue of the contract, uh, the new aristocratic industrial class treats workers poorly. Um, says that they have they 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 fail to to have the same kinds of moral obligations to them as as ancient aristocrats had to their had to their serfs. Um, so Tocqueville is very interested in the potential problems that 
industry as it's really getting going in this you know, 1830s, 40s, 50s uh, might encounter and the ways in which it echoes and does not echo earlier, earlier forms that they've seen. Um, in his political or in his, his life as a politician, um, yes, Tocqueville was very interested in, in rail. I mean, he, scholars speculate he was interested in getting a railroad out to, to, to Lille and to, to parts of Normandy because he didn't like traveling by stagecoach to Paris. <laughs> so some of it was possibly self-serving. Very right? self-serving. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but no, he was very interested in, in, um, in, in, you know, trying to, trying to capture these new developments to try to, um, try to make life better for people, right? But what's another practical effect of having a good railroad that would connect Paris with the provinces? It would mean Paris, uh, it could France could be decentralized. So did right? he ever make a moral claim or, I mean, it, it, descriptive claims, obviously, against the democratic American model mm-hmm. and the aristocratic French model? Like, did, did he ever make comparative claims or moral claims? Like, did he see France having to come more on board with the democratic idea or you know did he ever uh, uh, deal with those kinds of tensions yes certainly so in the in i mean he, he in his introduction to democracy in america he says uh, he basically says i am afraid that no one will like this book because i'm trying to see further than the parties i'm trying to see beyond the parties to see what the future really entails hmm. um and so in some ways, I'm going to be a partisan of democracy, and in other ways, I'm going to be a partisan of not democracy, <laughs> meaning meaning aristocratic mores sure. and norms. And so his project is very much to try to, on the one hand, convince people who are skeptical of democracy that democracy is a providential fact brought by God, permitted by God, that nevertheless has to be educated and made good, right? So, so in that sense, he's an aristocrat. Right, he has a kind of aristocratic liberalism that wants to say democracy is good, and yet there are truths about the human condition or about politics that democracy obscures, and so um, we need to do what we can to build up democracy in its weak points, which is why he's so keen on what he considers to be um, aristocratic remainders, so Christian religion. Association, which he says, association in democracy basically functions as an aristocratic person, used to function. You know, sort of the force of a lord standing up to the king is the force that an association can have standing up to the centralized government, right? Um, and so his project really is one of trying to to weigh democracy and aristocracy for their for their merits and demerits, um, while convincing people that democracy is the regime. That we have, it is here to stay, and again, it's historical, right? So, so compared to Plato, Aristotle, uh, even Montesquieu, who had a variety of different kinds of regime types, right? That were all, uh, in theory, possible at any given moment in time, right? Uh, Tocqueville takes the, the the movement from aristocracy to democracy to be inevitable, well, not, perhaps not inevitable. That might be too strong of a word, but it's historical. We can't return to aristocracy on Tocqueville's view, but we can try to preserve the truths that about the human condition that aristocracy upheld particularly well, mm-hmm. truths like liberty, uh, a certain kind of diversity, a certain kind of, uh, of freedom, uh, and, and try to build those into, into democracy, both for the sake of democratic politics in its best form, but also for, for the human condition. Yeah, I wonder what he would say. I mean, again, just this morning, I mean, uh, on Twitter, they were posting videos of – you're probably very familiar with the upheaval in France mm-hmm. at the moment with Macron uh, changing the retirement age from 64 to – 62 to 64. Mm-hmm. Is that right? I, I, it's two, I, I, it's I, two years. I think it's 62 to 64. And um, the, the videos that were released today were these large-scale demonstrations and the police going in – to physically fight them. And um, I mean, they're all in riot gear. And the two videos that were wildly viral today were Molotov cocktails Mm -hmm. thrown from the roofs onto the – so uh, dozens of police officers catching on fire Mm -hmm. all at once. You know, I mean, just revolution. I mean, if we see that, that's – um, and and so I wonder what he I mean this is purely speculative right but I mean I wonder is, is does his own home country is it dealing you know 200 years later with some of these issues because it's not fully arist- aristocratic 
France, right? You mm-hmm. know, in, in, in mm-hmm. the modern age. I guess mm-hmm. I'm where I'm trying to go with this is about every decade there seems to be a book, even though the, you know 200 years ago, and this is a very this is a core text. But every decade, you know, in America, you know, the quest for community, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. bowling alone. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I could have you know written a mm-hmm. hundred books down probably, and more recently, um, deaths of dis- this, uh, this concept of um, Angus Deaton and his wife engaging this idea of deaths of despair. Mm-hmm. So you have sociologists, historians, economists. All kind of touching yes. uh, on these things yes. um, with, within, and these are, again were American. The, the, the three books I just mentioned, but do you see, you know, uh, his De Tocqueville's core message still needed and still applicable for today? Because I've heard some people, you know, that was two hundred years ago, and it's we've so evolved beyond that. You know, I've heard arguments in, in engaging that it might either not be useless, but it it was a historical artifact, and now we need to move on. Do you do you still useful for today? I, I certainly think it's useful for today, and I think there are um, I think there are some some wonderful political scientists, political theorists, um, who are uh, you know in in one way or another sort of carrying on uh, the tradition that Tocqueville. Started right, so you so you mentioned a few, but I might add, um, you know, the philosopher Matthew Crawford has written oh, yeah. a number of books. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm quite a fan, and I've actually used his his uh, writings um, from his latest book, Why We Drive, Why we drive yeah. to help students think about um, the pluses and minuses of certain forms of Republican liberty hmm. uh, compared with the safety or the um, uh, safeguards that maybe not soft despotism, but some sort of centralized authority might provide, right? And to have that debate. Um, and so I, I, I do think, uh, again, I like to think with Tocqueville. Tocqueville doesn't comment on everything, but he provides lots of resources to, again, continue to think creatively, philosophically um, about about the human condition under democracy, um, and I do, yeah. So I, I, I do take it. Uh, I do take his his writings to still be incredibly insightful. Um, and I, I had a piece in in Law and Liberty last year, last year in the summer, um, applying applying Tocqueville's thinking about aristocratic versus democratic families to the very popular oh, wow. television show Succession. Oh yes. Um, and and the piece was basically trying to tease out the ways in which the family, as portrayed in the television show. Is is in ways both aristocratic and democratic, and what that tells us about about the nature of the family business, about the nature of of, of wealth in America, um, and so I, I do think he's he's even if we don't want to take Tocqueville's um, statements as as factually descriptive of something that's happening on the ground, right? Um, you know, he one of one of his most um, I think moving and and important chapters is is his chapter on on um, on race in America, right? So there's a lot that he was describing in the 1830s yeah. that that doesn't quite map on. Uh, there's a lot that still might map on. Um, so even if we can't say Tocqueville's statement on page 100 is still true, <laughs> and sure. so therefore we should take him at his word, we can still use his use his manner of thinking to think really productively about about the state of American society today. And I also happen to think he's still right about many things, yeah, even if even if not everything. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll link to that article in, in the show oh, okay, notes. So great. yeah, people yeah. can read that as well, because that's a really great up to, you know, succession. What a, what a story, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, I mean, th- this has been fantastic. And what I what I was encouraged to do in just listening to you is, is thinking um, – I've read the first volume. I haven't read the second. And so thinking through that that framework that you said earlier, mm-hmm. man, I really want to explore that more because that seems this idea of soft despotism emerging um, because we want or, – or because it's the, the water in which we swim. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it seems to be a but – but getting the framework right. Right. And that's the pleasure of teaching. And Absolutely. only a few more questions and we'll close here. But it, um, you, you said you were able to teach at undergrads at Harvard. I mean, what, what have been some of your experiences there? Um, I know you're a student of uh, Harvey Mansfield yes. and, and uh, as well as Michael Sandel and yes. others. And, yes. um, so you've had some great teachers, you know, as, as role model or mentors at least. And um, what have some of your teaching experiences, you know, how has that oh, formed you? Um, I, I love teaching. I, I think one of 
one of the great joys of of doing what I do in the academy is is being able to introduce students to Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Tocqueville, um, and uh, and you know in some cases I've been doing that as as a teaching fellow, so working with a professor like Harvey Mansfield, Michael Sandel, Richard Tuck, um, a variety of others. Uh, and sometimes I've had the opportunity to do that as as the as the person who's designing the syllabus and, and doing the heavy lifting myself, sure. um, which is also fun. Um, no, I think uh, on the on the one hand, there's a lot that one could say about things that are going wrong in the academy right now. Um, Nobody ever talks about it. <laughs> no one ever talks about it. No, everything's hunky dory. Right. Um, but on the other hand, I do think that um, actually being in the classroom with students. Uh, Encounter where they're encountering these great texts, these great ideas that are are often not always, but often life changing. Um, it gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a, a lot of hope, not just for higher education, but for um, but for political possibilities more broadly. So I think some of my you know my favorite experiences have been teaching Aristotle, teaching Tocqueville, having conversations with students about Plato, the structure of the city and speech, and the noble lie. Right. So in the noble lie, um, uh, you know, Plato, Plato suggests that, um, you know, citizens of the city and speech are told that they have different qualities of soul. Right. Talking with Harvard students who are excellent students, the cream of the crop. Yeah. Right. About, um, you know, how do we understand? <laughs> do, do, do we with our democratic sensibilities want to follow Plato there? And yet we're at Harvard, yeah. the cream of the crop, right? So, so being able to have those kinds of, of conversations with students is just is just fantastic. And it does actually, um, you know, it, it, it does sometimes. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a, I'll get an email from a student at the end of a semester about about their experience in a course that I've taught, and these these run the gamut from uh, your your our discussion of Aristotle on. On uh, temperance led me to give up drinking. <laughs> wow! <Okay. laughs> to um, to uh, you know, thank you for improving me on my writing. Um, reading Plato has brought me closer to my Muslim faith. Mm. I got that once. I have gotten student emails to the effect that I was reading Dostoevsky, and it made me think of Pascal and Tocqueville. And it turns out Dostoevsky was familiar with at least Pascal. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, those are probably some of my personal highlights. Yeah. Just seeing the ways in which students can actually grasp onto these ideas and um, and run with them in a variety of interesting and, and kind of unpredictable ways. Oh, for sure, yeah, unpredictable. I like that because there is something magical, isn't there, about um, taking a student for sixteen weeks through a line of thought or uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, introducing them mm -hmm. to you know Aristotle or in, and, and and seeing the lights come on. Absolutely. In ways that we can't design. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, I, I like what you say, taking them through mm -hmm. a line of thought, because um, something I often like to say to students is that, yes, we are going to explore a theme. We are going to explore a set of thinkers or one thinker dedicated to this theme and to this question. You don't have to agree with it. Absolutely. But I want you to engage it, take it seriously, and have your reasons for or against mm -hmm. So let's walk together in this way, yeah. um, because I, I mean, generally speaking, you know, often often there can be an impulse to not want to impose ideas on students, and it's right not to impose, but mm -hmm. but it it's it's also right to encourage genuine engagement yeah. by taking the ideas seriously. Yeah, and it's not necessarily if you do it right. I think it's not imposing; it's exposing. Yes, to to, to the line of thought, the, the the way of reasoning through an give idea. Give them something to to reflect on and and bounce. Give them something solid to bounce their ideas against. Yeah, and it, I mean, isn't it Aristotle? I'm going to butcher the quote, but the idea of it's um, it's virtuous to be able to take an idea. Without accept, to, to think about an idea without accepting it, like you, you'd be able to b bat it around and think through what it means and its implications. And even uh, Tocqueville seems like in his friendships, he was trying that. You know, in, in um, I, I, I need to ask though, I need to come full circle on. So the trial did did his friendship persist yes. through, through that and, yes. and yes. after that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. And then how about the one with you know scientific racism and some of these? Ideas? Did did his friendship persist? Do you know? That, that? sort of fizzled out. Yeah, I was going to say that's even <laughs> a, because that's what you see now, right? Um, and we'll, we'll close with this idea, but it, I I think 
you, you, it, it, it seems harder and harder, largely, in my opinion, because of social media, but others, um, mass media as well, um, that you can't have sustained friend, friendships over with disagreement involved of any kind. It seems like you're either 100 percent with or against. And I know that's uh, – if you have real human friends, we know where it's not that binary, but it, it's sometimes portrayed that way and feels – that way, the, especially the more you're Im- embedded in social media and things. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you, do you sense that as well? Well, so this is where um, this is where it's always helpful to think about similarity or equality of what hmm. and differences of what or differences in what. Right? It's never simply a matter of similarity or difference, um, agreement or disagreement. But it's always dependent on what the subject matter is. Right? And, and Aristotle. In his in his portrayal of of the closest friendships that we have, the virtue seeking friendships say that friends uh, to maintain a virtue seeking friendship have to be seeking virtue together. They have to be compatible in virtue from the get go, and they have to be seeking it. Um, and if one of them's not, that creates a difficult situation. So on the one hand, um, on on the one hand, it's important that. Uh, we be able to see people and encounter people, really uh, gather together and then encounter people in the fullness of who they are, right? Um, uh, but on the but on the other hand, I think I think you know Aristotle at least would certainly say that there are limits to the number of people we're going to be close friends with, and that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's close with this in in. Um what projects or themes are exciting you in the future? I know you're you're graduate, you know, you're finishing your dissertation and, and, and moving on later this year. What are some things in the for, uh, future that you're looking forward to? Yeah, so um, I'm completing my dissertation, which is on um, it's on self interest rightly understood. So that's sort of front front of my mind. Um, but broadly speaking, I, I think I'm I'm again I'm interested in this conversation that you can have. Um, you know, with Tocqueville and with the ancients about the nature of well-being, of human flourishing. And so a lot of my interests sort of flow flow from that. So um, again, I have I have a few projects that I'm, I'm working on developing that have to do with technology, um, industry, science, ideas about humanitarianism. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm very interested in sort of uh, conversations about, about the nature of work, about feminism. So um, so I'm, 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 uh, my first project is completing my dissertation Absolutely. and then, and then I am, I'm free to play a little bit more. Well, we wish you the absolute best, Sarah. It, it'll be fun to watch you as you, uh, grow into more of a, a scholar and you, you finish at Harvard and move on to your next thing. We, uh, wish you the absolute best. Thank you for joining us well, for Acton Line. Thank you. It was a delight to be here. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Combs.